first, a, a major shout out to Rebecca Fowler, who helped all of us get our uh, stuff together for this. She gave us lots of great tips, including to use humor if possible in our stories. Uh, humor is a tall order in my case because I'm talking about earthquakes, and earthquakes aren't actually funny, except in the movies where earthquake depictions can sometimes be a little over the top. You can imagine how relieved I was to get her to San Francisco and see that the bridge is in fact still standing. <laughs> it's important to keep calm, carry on, and keep earthquake risk in perspective. The fact is, if you live in California, you're more likely to be killed in a car accident or even to be murdered than to be killed in a car. Earthquakes are, however, still bad news, and it's a different equation in the developing world where you have enormous vulnerabilities. Some experts have concluded it's only a matter of time before a single earthquake kills one million people. If you had asked many of us before this year where, which location we especially worried about, the storied city of Kathmandu, Nepal, likely would have been at or near the top of many of our lists. We know that Nepal sits atop a very active plate boundary. We know that the Indian Peninsula is continuing to move northward into Eurasia. It's continuing to build up the Himalayan rain. That this process occurs primarily in abrupt lurches or earthquakes. We knew it was a matter of time before large earthquakes would hit the fall. On April 25th, it appeared that worse fears were realized when the Borka earthquake nucleated to the west of the city, broke the major plate boundary fault towards the east, directly under the Kathmandu Valley. It should have been a worst case scenario. Uh, in images like this, which you probably saw, what started to catch my eye even early on was not the damage that you see in the foreground, but the damage that you don't see in the background. Uh, I flew into Kathmandu about a month later, and this was the view out my window. What you can see here is a sea of overwhelmingly intact buildings. It was not the view that I expected. We'll have to see out. Okay, so the major question of this earthquake, to my mind, is notwithstanding the, the, the toll that it did take, is why wasn't the damage even worse? Why wasn't this the catastrophic uh, disaster that many of us had feared? And so scientists are now working with available data to answer that question. This one record tells us that the Kathmandu Valley basically moved up and to the south in a span of about five seconds. Analyzing that and other data, uh, one part of the answer is that the fault that moved was able to unzip relatively smoothly, uh, so directly under Kathmandu Valley, but it did not release a lot of jittery, high frequency shaking that would have been more damaging. The ground moved back and forth and with a period of about five seconds. That would have been bad news for 50 story buildings, but there aren't any in Nepal. Structures like this were basically little ships along the ride on very long swells, and they performed quite well. Still, there was a lot of energy from this earthquake. We sometimes say that valleys will amplify shaking like a proverbial bowl of jello. Um, in fact, a better analogy for very strong earthquakes is a box of sand. If you try to shake a box of sand, the grains are going to move, they're going to shift, they're going to absorb some of the energy. It's a process we call nonlinearity. And in fact, the shaking was more moderate in the center of the valley than at the edges. The last part of the answer is uh, maybe the most interesting. The earthquake did release a high frequency jittery energy that would have been damaging, but not uniformly. It was concentrated along the northern edge of the rupture, this swath of white dots. And that turns out to correlate uh, quite nicely with where the shaking was stronger. That is good news for Kathmandu Valley, which was right on top of the fault rupture, but a good 35 kilometers from where the high frequency energy was coming from. This has important implications for other areas, including my neighborhood, Los Angeles, which has a huge Honkin de Colmont fault running underneath it. And it's going to make a huge difference for hazard if when, when an earthquake happens on that fault, is the high frequency damaging, shaking, radiated everywhere, or only along part of the fault. So the thought I want to end on is this. Uh, 
the reason that it's important to monitor earthquakes everywhere and to chase them to the ends of the earth when they do happen is in part because black and brown and yellow lights matter. But it's also because seismology is a young science. And by studying big earthquakes anywhere in the world, we can learn important lessons about earthquake processes and earthquake hazards everywhere in the world.